Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in Salesforce Epic Hour. Today, we are going to talk about how to leverage GraphQL to improve data gathering in Salesforce. And we have two great speakers, uh, Christopher and uh, Sebastian, uh, with us. So let me hand over them for the presentation and the session. Hand over to you guys. Thank you for the introduction and um, yeah, having us again. And we are happy to present today, as you already teased a little bit, um, yeah, what is actually capable with GraphQL. First of all, give us a minute to introduce ourselves. So my name is Christopher. I'm the Salesforce CTO for Capgemini Germany. I'm a Salesforce CTA and yeah, a little bit of kind of a well-architected advocate um, in the last, yeah, roughly now seven and a half years already within Capgemini. I'm mainly responsible for um, yeah, enterprise customers, which have a focus in the automotive industry or manufacturing industry. And I'm happy that Sebastiano um, is part of our session today as well, and maybe hand over to Sebastiano to um, give one, two words so that he can introduce also himself. Sure, happy to do that. Um, yeah, so uh, Sebastiano here. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know, actively working in Salesforce ecosystem for roughly five, five and a half years now, um, mainly focusing uh, on my role as solution architect. Um, yeah, dealing with a lot of integration, but also DevOps related topics for our enterprise clients at Capgemini. And um, yeah, I used to come from a, a software engineering background beforehand, mostly to, uh, focusing on front end engineering. So I'm well aware of GraphQL and um, yeah, I'm quite happy that uh, recently uh, Salesforce is adopting um, this concept more and more uh, into the platform and um, yeah really hoping to convince some more Salesforce developers to look into GraphQL after the session, uh, because I still have the impression that it's not yet that widely adopted. And that's a great starting point, I guess, for a little bit of background. And, and that's a kind of an advertisement blog, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> But uh, as Sebastian already teased a little bit, there is this kind of new fancy tool um, within your tool chain or toolkit um, as solution option. And I would like as an architect to emphasize to you that integrations and integration patterns, um, yeah, there are multiple different, mutable different ways how you um, build up integration between different systems um, with Salesforce and the different kind of external systems. Um, let me tell you one kind of story. So once I was pulled in into like a customer meeting um, where I talked to the integration architect because it was like a situation where like a kind of a sales implementation um, or a yeah, calculation tool um, was there as a kind of a backend solution based on, on Azure. And there was Salesforce on this kind of acting as a UI layer um, as an, well, with the aid of an experience cloud um, so that end users could log in and see then financial kind of KPIs and figures. And there was some, some kind of miscalculation and the task was that I have a look why this has actually happened. And yeah, so the, the first thing I heard and I was talking to the, the integration specialist from the project was like, our integration is, is scalable and the pattern we're using, it, it, it's totally fine. And after like um, diving into a little bit deeper, it turned out that it's um, actually not fine. So that the calculation, some parts were happening on the Azure side, some were um, fired and triggered off within Salesforce. Some stuff happened synchronously. Um, a lot of stuff um, happened and even kind of asynchronously. There was like a weird mix um, and it, it, it turned out that was like the, the whole integration concept was a mess. So first of all, I would like to emphasize you there that that well architected in terms of like data integrity is offering some kind of patterns and independence and i don't go over the, the full list now um for today but i would like to emphasize you that salesforce and the well architected team provided that kind of great overview in terms of like how they actually envision some kind of data operation parts in terms of like what are the, the kind of patterns and if you're looking at the right side you have like a respective field mapping you potentially using asynchronous Apex, you're using feature methods, and potentially you have some kind of orchestration in place for complex um, sequences. 
Um, that's all right. Um, there's another aspect, obviously, in terms of like when you're thinking about integration, that's like how the integration pattern, your the integration um, you, you're designing for, and which kind of concept you're using. That's also coming into the picture. And here in that case, for example, it was like, it was a calculation which the, from an end user perspective, which was totally accepted that it happened kind of asynchronously, even with like some kind of delay, nobody expected like having the real figures directly in place. Um, that's also something I always see. And as a kind of, um, when I'm judging CTA mocks, I always see that kind of pitfall that we all tend to build up um, and designing um, yeah, integration patterns, which needs to happen in real time, synchronously based on request and reply. And sometimes that, that's very, you're adding a lot of complexity to your solution with that kind of approach. And that's something which is like, in, in most of the cases, it's not needed. Nobody's expecting that. Um, obviously, there are cases um, where this is expected and um, where like tools and technologies like GraphQL can, can actually shine. But furthermore, there's another aspect within kind of an architect that I would like to emphasize you, um, and that's performance. So as I meant before, it's like, yes, there are certain operations where you're looking for kind of real data or real-time integration, um, but you need to also take into the picture um, how you can build up the performance. I guess we all, I mean, it's holiday season. It's like kind of um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday week um, coming around. And, and maybe you have some kind of issues with um, some parts and stuff you um, you buy and you need to contact um, the service centers. And maybe it's just me because I'm working in that kind of IT um, area, but I always find it a little bit um, yeah, disappointing when I inherit like the, the bad software systems from others. And I guess we all have that kind of feeling that that awkward silence if you're talking to a customer agent on the phone and he's waiting that the integration actually happens. So retrieving maybe order data, retrieving your personal data, retrieving some kind of data, and there's this, this awkward moment of silence, and then there's this kind of excuse, sorry, I need to open like the system X, Y, Z. And that's always like um, something which comes into the picture. It's like, yes, when you're designing integration, um, it obviously needs to fulfill its task in terms of like the vanilla case, but you also need to take into consideration um, is that kind of scalable and is that um, performant also if in, in areas and when it potentially also needs to perform when we are talking about weeks like the Black Friday week. So thinking of that one, yeah? so you have tons of requests and how the Salesforce instance is, is kind of handling that. And especially with that kind of example of the um, yeah, ordering stuff, potentially you need to fetch like the information from different kinds of systems. So we have tons of integrations kicking off and that can be a kind of a very overload for your Salesforce instance, as well as obviously in terms of like the consumption of like governor limits you have in place, um, even like consumption based um, stuff like API calls you need to um, yeah, execute and perform. So there are tons of considerations. And I would like to emphasize you always when it comes to integration to going one step backwards, thinking first of like your integration approach, your integration pattern, while then um, thinking of like picking the right um, tool to actually do and get the job done. So with that said, let's talk about the, the new kit on the block, at least within the Salesforce ecosystem. So what's GraphQL? So very basically, and, and, and I'm starting small is like, it's a kind of an, um, first of all, maybe saying it's not new. Facebook designed it already 2012, so 12 years ago, and made it public available 2015. So it's in, in our terms and in kind of the terminology, it's almost like um, quite old. And, um, but nevertheless, since roughly a year, a little bit longer, it's part of the Salesforce, um, or it's part of Salesforce and available within Salesforce and Salesforce already added a lot of stuff um, within the, the latest releases. And Sebastian and I are glad to share some stuff later with you, um, with you alongside what's coming up. So first of all, what's, what is it? Um, it's kind of a query language um, specification and offers 
at a single endpoint. And that's like the, the most important stuff is like it offers a single endpoint, unlike REST, where you have like multiple endpoints. You see that here within the, um, the graphic on the right side. So within REST, you typically have like a client and then the client needs to fetch like um, maybe kind of different in our Salesforce terminology, most likely objects like account contact in order to um, fulfill a dedicated task and job. So that's one part. Um, while with GraphQL and with the single endpoint, you're just reaching out to that specific endpoint and the endpoint then is trying or is, is fetching the data based on your query. So that's like the second important aspect. Um, you have like a great flexibility in terms of the queries. So the client can request exactly the data they need. So taking account contact order is a great example is like, it's a bunch of data which relates to each other in, in most circumstances and most business use cases. And within GraphQL, you directly can provide that as an um, as in query. And with that, you just query what you need. So that tremendously um, reduces the payload um, compared to, to REST. Um, Sebastian and I, we found a great um, analogy, which is, which is kind of great and which explains it in, in a very simple, simple term. So within the REST API, it's, it's most likely if you're ordering something a la carte. So you have like a specific dish and the chef the kitchen also decides what is like the, uh, the, the, the sides and what is part of like the dish and you just grab that specific dish, um, which is like sometimes a lot of stuff, but you're maybe just like interested in the, I don't know, the potatoes and the sides or in that specific meat or vegetables, whatever. Um, while with GraphQL, it's more like a buffet. You're, you're just getting there and just you, you grab what you need um, based on, on your demands and your preference. And that's like a totally different way how you can envision then um, certain integration strategies. And with that said, I guess, Sebastiano, let's dive a little bit deeper into the details. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, so the uh, concept or the approach that GraphQL is taking um, for yeah speci specifying or um, yeah building up these kind of requests to get your data is kind of different. So if you look to the example on the left hand side, which is pretty basic for the for starters, um, that would be a simple uh, query reflecting like varying uh, a list of accounts and specifically the ID and name field for each of the records. So, but what do we have in, in GraphQL? So first of all, we also support all kinds of CRUD operations, right? So all cre uh, create, read, update, and delete operations are uh, built in there. And in uh, GraphQL, um, we differentiate between these two with two operation types called query on the one hand side and mutation on the other side where query handles all the read operations and the mu mutation um, uh, type, all the yeah, modifying operations, let's say. When it comes to the rest of the um, structure that you see here in the example, um, you also find two other probably new terms to you, which are edges and nodes, um, whereas edges are to handle sort of lists, right? So as I mentioned, where the example on the left-hand side, um, somehow reflects uh, yeah, a simple query for getting a list of accounts. So the edges would be your list um, and the nodes would be the single entries or respectively Salesforce records within this list that we would get returned if we send this kind of GraphQL request. And um, be below the node, each of the fields in this case that I would like to know more about for each of my account records are specified. In this case, just the ID and the name. And because Christopher was also talking about the buffet and um, linkage between different records and data, um, if we move, move on, uh, we also have a bit more uh, complex example. So let's say um, you are interested into um, knowing more about contacts in your org. But not only the data that is directly part of the contact, but also its relationships, like, for example, the associated cases. And maybe you would also like to know to which uh, to which account your contact belongs to. Um, then you can also do that within one single query um, in GraphQL. And it would look like something like what you see on the left hand side. 
Um, so uh, you would have, again, your contact on top. And then, um, yeah, again, the edges, like reflecting the list of uh, contacts you're interested in. And for each of these uh, contacts, you will also request another list. So another set of edges with notes, so to say, for cases and respectively also for the account that belongs to this contact. And um, this is, of course, a whole different syntax that you, first of all, need to get used to. And uh, But we will also look into uh, some hands-on examples in a second. But um, if we move on maybe to the next slide, then um, we would all, if we now like checked how the query would look like, but what about the response? And when we look at such a response, then it maybe becomes even clearer what edges and nodes mean. So um, here we have another example. On the left-hand side, we again have a request for getting some account data, this time with associated uh, opportunities to it. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have the uh, result. So the response that we would get um, from our databases where you can see, okay, on top, you again have the account, the edges reflect the list of accounts um, where each node is one single account record with the, in this case, the ID and the name of the account, edge communications, just some sample data. And then as well, we have the opportunities as a related list for, for our account, which again contains um, the opportunity records that belong to this account with the values we asked for, in this case, the name and the amount. And if you like want to have a comparisons to like more easily relate this to Sockle um, on the left hand uh, bottom side, you can also see that there is the um, yeah, relationship query um, that would reflect the request that we um, showed here in uh, GraphQL. And um, this essentially also brings us maybe to the next slide um, because what we what we see, and this brings me back to what I mentioned at the very beginning of the session during my introduction, um, what we still face is that GraphQL is not really yet like adopted by Salesforce developers, at least that's that's my impression. And the reason for this could, of course, be the valid question, okay, why do I need to learn about another new API, another like completely different syntax? Um, According to what we saw on the previous slide, you have like such a big uh, 20, 20 line script to reflect one query that I could simply write as a one liner in Sockel. And um, I would get the like similar result. But of course, there's a bit more to it, and there's a bit more flexibility that you can gain with GraphQL. And um, maybe to, to convince you a bit more to look into this closer, um, I would suggest uh, let's uh, maybe dive into it a bit more hands-on. And therefore, Christopher, I would ask you maybe to pause your screen share for a second, and then what I would take it over. So uh, what you should see, hopefully, is um, my browser uh, with Postman opened. Um, so overall, of course, when it comes to Salesforce platform APIs, we have a lot, right? We have composite API, bulk API. We, of course, also have our REST API that we partly mentioned. And um, there's also GraphQL. And what Salesforce does is they are providing us as architects or de uh, developers with um, a whole Postman collection that contains a lot of examples for these different types of APIs. And this, of course, also applies to GraphQL. So if we look into this, um, then we see that for both, for the UI, for executing queries, we have a whole list of examples as well as for mutations, so like for modifying operations. And um, what I did beforehand, and I would share some some uh, link with an uh, yeah setup tutorial for that uh, uh, later on in the chat is um, I connected this to a threaded playground so that we are able to actually query some sample um, data with this. And if we look at the examples again, maybe starting off with uh, a simple the simple accounts query that we looked at at the beginning, um, then you will maybe recognize two points. So on the one hand side, um, in GraphQL, all requests that we are doing are post requests. So um, if we compare this to, to REST, for example, when you are reading data or fetching data, then um, you usually also have get requests, 
um, or different type of uh, or different request types like put for for modifications and stuff like that. But for um, GraphQL, you most likely only have post, which you can also validate. If I would, for example, try to execute this as a GET request, then I will get the um, error message that GET is not allowed in uh, GraphQL here. And the reason for this is um, that for GraphQL, as you specify this like bigger or it can potentially be a bigger um, query in the end, um, this would not be enough to be specified as a UL query parameter, which we have most likely in GET requests. So we are using POST. And what you recognize as well is um, we have one standardized endpoint, which is what uh, Christopher mentioned. So um, instead of having different resources to request different types of entities or uh, Salesforce objects, you just request this one single endpoint all the time. And not only for um, read operations, so for our queries, but also for all uh, data modifications like creations or deletions. And the differentiation between the different types of operations we want to perform simply happens all in the body with this GraphQL schema. So if I would execute this sample request, then I would get my plain simple list of accounts at, as we saw at the beginning. And um, yeah, with the respective informations, the ID, the name, and so on. And if we maybe look at a more complex example with the um, example that we showed on, the, on, the, uh, on one of the slides where we um, are interested into the contact, um, uh, into the contacts with the related cases and accounts, and we execute that one, then uh, you can also see how the list structure is um, building up. So um, if we go maybe like a bit more slowly top to bottom, then you see that first of all, your query is on the contacts. Below that, you again have edges like your list, which you also can see like by the opening array bracket. And below that, you have different objects, different nodes for, for the different records, which contain the list of cases. In this case, there's just one case associated um, with this contact, as well as the related accounts that this uh, contact belongs to. If we scroll further down, you would have another case. And uh, for this case, again, you would have the uh, related, <coughs> for this contact, sorry, you again have the related cases. And maybe to make it a bit more obvious, because I see in this query, um, we did not request any fields for the contact itself. Of course, you could also add some fields for the for the contact um, into this list, like for example, the ID, or you could also um, add the, uh, the name of the contact. And if we request this again, then maybe the structure is also a bit more bit more obvious because then in our list of contacts, we um, also for each contact in the list, we see the ID of that contact, its name, and then below that, the uh, list of cases and the related account. So then the structure maybe becomes a bit more understandable. And yeah, as you can see, um, you can really do complex operations. Uh, this is quite flexible and uh, as well as maintainable because you have some sort of uh, you have some sort of, oh, let me see why I did some. You can keep wrong. going or let me see. Somebody use pencil. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> maybe someone wanted to highlight something. Um, okay, but let's, let's continue. So uh, as we looked into queries, uh, you see it's quite flexible. It's quite um, uh, maintainable um, because you have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of flexibility and it's like, self-documented in a sense that you have this quite like strict schema that you can follow to uh, get all your data. And same applies, of course, also when you want to create or modify data. So um, for mutations, so like for all modifying operations, the structure looks a bit different. Um, and like if we look at this structure, this would, for example, uh, create an account with the name Trailblazer Express and um, would return us um, as a response, like confirming that the creation was successful, the ID and uh, name for that created account. But before I execute that, I could not only do this, I could of course also execute multiple um, modifying operations for multiple objects. So let's say in the same kind of request, I want to not only create an account, but let's say I also want to 
maybe create a case, let's say. Even not sure if this use case makes sense at the moment, but I would be able to do that and just set the subject to um, something, let's say um, my case. And uh, then of course, changing this to the subject here as well. And if I then run this request again against my trailer playground, then it should hopefully uh, successfully create uh, two accounts, uh, which it didn't. Probably I probably I just ah of course I need to also have the correct uh, entity specified or the correct object specified. So let's do that again. And then we see that our operation succeeds. Um, I get a response with uh, the information like the record ID and the name for the account I created, as well as for the case, I get the ID and the subject I specified. And um, yeah, so this is like to show that it's quite flexible and that you can do a lot of things with it. And now we just checked out records and maybe a small uh, small thing I would like to show you as well as we can actually also get information about our metadata in a very powerful way. And for that, there are no examples in the um, in the Postman collection, but we can quickly um, build a, build a request jointly. And for that, I would jump in the GraphQL API specification. So then uh, you also see that already. And if you go here, then there are a lot of explanations regarding the schema structure we talked about, but also about querying records. And there's also a section where you can uh, find some information and examples how you can uh, get information about your object metadata. Like for example, if we, if we uh, check on the information that you could request, it's like the API name of your object, it's child relationships and um, all these kind of things. And uh, like, for example, also the available record types, the default record type, if it's modifiable and so on and so forth. And if I want to like request this data, for example, then here again, there are also some uh, sample queries that I could simply copy. And if I go back to my Postman collection, I would simply create a new request. In this request, I just specify my GraphQL body where I simply paste the sample code that I just copied over regarding the object infos for my account. And of course I change to post as we just discussed. And I also need to copy the URL, which as we already confirmed is uh, always the same because I always request the exact same endpoint. And then I can also give it some, some name like get account metadata, for example, um, to know what I'm actually doing here and if I send this request to my org, then it should bring me um, hopefully a whole bunch of information regarding my account object. So if I check the result, then I get a lot of object infos for my account object, like all the relationship fields that my account has, like um, uh, the account history, if I scroll further down the asset and contacts and all those uh, informations. And if I would scroll that whole list even further down, then you also have the information for all kind of fields that are sitting uh, on this object with all the details. And um, so you can see that you can really get a lot of information out of your org with uh, really like comparably simply simple queries. So it's very powerful um, to work with this tool. And something that I see as a potential, let's say, yeah, point that could stop you to adopt it or that, 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 that Salesforce are a bit hesitant to look into this is of course this whole new syntax. But um, yeah, as nowadays, uh, a lot of us are maybe using AI support when developing um, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of requests or code in general, you can also leverage your API of, uh, AI of choice, of course, to get some information regarding the uh, GraphQL query structure. Um, if you are into Sockle anyway, and you still want to uh, write your Sockle queries on your own, there is also um, a nice uh, Chrome extension and tool, which is called Salesforce Explorer. Maybe you anyway know it. And as part of that, we will also share the link later on. There is a, um, a generator actually, 
where you can uh, type in your um, Sockle query, like what you actually want to query, and then it will automatically then generate for you the respective GraphQL schema. So if I clear that for a second, and I just simply write a new query, just removing that, and let's say I take the example of querying some, some case information, then you can see, um, even though it's of course a very simple query now, that it will automatically build up the respective schema for that. I could also enhance it with some where clause, for example, where I'm interested into the ID of that case. And even that like would result in the respective query there. So if you don't want to write the GraphQL schema manually, there are also options uh, that get you covered. And um, with that, as we had like a deeper look into the uh, Salesforce platform API when it comes to GraphQL, I would like to go back to the slides. So I would hand back to you, Christopher. And um, then we also wanted to have a look at a like different aspect. And this different aspect is leveraging GraphQL as part of your platform itself. So within sales or service cloud, maybe also for external sites, which is also not possible uh, with, with experience sites where you can also leverage GraphQL in the UI. And to start off with that, we said we want to play a bit of Mythbusters and clear up with something. Um, if you go, go back to, to, to the previous one. Um, and um, this is a point that where um, we also internally often have chats about, have chats with our developers. And this is when it comes to generally building your UI uh, structure or your UI components, you often get to hear, okay, if I want to have like this kind of complex scenario there where I need to, I don't know, get data from multiple objects, maybe also do some calculations, some filtering, pagination, maybe even, then I always need to build some apex on top of that to get this data in the proper shape or format. And this is something that is like not fully true, let's say, because there are also other options that Salesforce provides us with. And um, yeah, with that, we can maybe jump to the next slide. And um, there are actually pre-built APIs that uh, Salesforce has in place for us. And something that exists for a longer time already is um, the UI REST API adapter. So maybe you also even used it at some point, the UI record API or UI object info API, which give you like REST based adapters when building LWC components to request data or metadata about your objects um, by yeah, just leveraging these kind of pre-built APIs without writing a single line of Apex code, which is quite nice. But the drawback of that so far was often that um, you have like limited functionalities. And as, as soon as you get some more complex queries, some more complex scenarios, you were like sort of blocked and you needed to go back to Apex again. And so what you have now is since some time, also, you also have a GraphQL wire adapter, meaning like a pre-built um, adapter to leverage GraphQL schema and GraphQL queries directly in your LWC components, again, without writing a single line of Apex code. And the advantages of that, um, we can maybe look, uh, look at in the next slide. And where we prepared some kind of comparison. And I must, I must admit, I was quite happy to see that um, Alba Rivas in some uh, code, li code live session for Salesforce developers also um, brought up this kind of, kind of structure because it gives you a nice option to uh, compare the different types of mechanisms that you can use in the UI to get your records. And if we start off with like, the capability of querying data or metadata for different kinds of objects, then in, in Apex or custom Apex, you can of course do that, right? So you can also do that within a single HTTP request. It's just a bit more complex because you need to write the whole code for that in your backend. You also need to provide a test class and, and have all this like additional maintenance effort, let's say. Um, when it comes to the UI REST wire adapters, you can also do that. You can also get information about multiple objects, like for example, accounts and cases, but not within the same request. So you would need to add like multiple wire adapters to your component to uh, get these different types of records. And then you also are still in charge in your UI component to do the respective mapping to bring the data together again. Whereas with GraphQL, 
you can do all of this in a single HTTP request, as we just saw with the um, with the Postman examples, and um, you can like combine this into one single request uh, with ease. And for let's say the flexibility and requesting different types of fields, like directly specifying which fields you're interested in. Of course, in Apex, again, full flexibility in the UI record APIs, partly because not all of these wire adapters support it. Whereas in GraphQL, again, you have the full support for that. And now we come with the third point to a part that is like quite important, again, coming also to the well back to the well-architected part. Um, and this is the Lightning Data Service. And the Lightning Data Service in, Sal uh, in Salesforce is a concept, especially for your for UI components, to keep your data in sync, to take care of caching mechanisms when you query your data, which is not something that is natively supported when you build custom Apex, but is supported when you leverage the wire adapters in your uh, UI LWC components. So if you would use the UI REST API uh, there or the GraphQL wire adapters, you would, of course, benefit from that there as well. And um, for the additional features, like the last point in the list, this is something that we uh, simply added to highlight it. So um, where you have less flexibility in Apex or the UI REST wire adapters, in GraphQL, you even get some additional features that GraphQL brings with it by default, like um, fragments, where fragments would be, you can like put out parts of queries, parts of mutations, and can reuse them at different places, which gives you a more nice like options um, to, to structure your code. And you also uh, have pagination mechanisms. So if you are querying large amounts of data, let's say, you also have the chance to like, if you want to show them, let's say in the UI and data table, then you have the chance to um, also add some pagination to it um, to, to, to achieve a nice user experience in the end. And maybe just to highlight small remarks at the bottom, um, what I showed earlier in terms of mutations, um, like the CRUD, uh, like the CRUD operations or the modifying operations is unfortunately as of now only supported in the platform API. So external services, for example, calling Salesforce can leverage this already, but this is not yet supported in the wire adapter. So for now in the LWC wire adapter for GraphQL, you can only leverage queries. And um, in general, when you're asking potentially about the limits or limitations that you have with GraphQL, they're sort of the same limitations as you also have uh, with Sockle Apply. And what this means in detail, um, I would again um, take it over, if you don't mind, Christopher, and maybe also show that part. Maybe in terms of mutations, just to add, that's what I meant before in terms of where States was adding more and more features um, to the GraphQL itself and functionalities within States was because mutation was not part of the initial scope. So if you potentially watch back all the recordings from um, what Sebastiano mentioned already from Alba, for example, mutation was not available there yet. So it was part of the summer release, I guess, right? If I still have it in mind. Mm, I think it's still not available yet. Uh, anyhow, yeah, Let, let's double check that again. Yeah. Um, so um, we are back in the uh, GraphQL API specification. And there, of course, you also get some insights about the potential li limitations that you would have. And as you can see, um, yeah, you will probably see some familiar numbers. So um, each query or subquery can, can only query up to 2,000 records at a time. Um, there's a limit also of the amount of subqueries that you can have. So there are still some constraints, let's say, that you need to deal with. And um, but there are also some some nice things actually. So when it comes to relationship queries, where we also looked at some examples earlier, um, you like have a quite high limit of supported uh, relation uh, relationships that you can reflect with your GraphQL schema that would allow you to actually, uh, not sure if this is an actual use case in some Salesforce implementation project, but you could even like leverage in one single call all different uh, relationships uh, that you have built on your standard or custom object and, uh, and query these in one single call. Um, but I would not go into detail through all of these. It's just to highlight where you where you can find it in the documentation. 
um, which is quite nicely structured. There are also, besides the Postman collection, a lot of examples also uh, provided here from Salesforce side, which is quite nice to, to, to really get you uh, started quickly. But as we just talked about the um, UI part or the UI implementation in uh, of GraphQL, there is um, a nice repository from Salesforce that I can uh, recommend looking into, which is called LWC Recipes. And um, this actually contains a lot of examples for different use cases, different use cases of the wire adapter, but also specifically for the uh, for some of the uh, GraphQL use cases, which some uh, with some sample components. And um, if you want to look at these um, components in one of your orgs, for example, um, then there's also a description on how you can bring all these components either on a scratch org or like like I did it for the sake of this demo, just create a new trailhead playground and you can um, push the components there. And what this will bring you is um, you will have your trailhead playground like I have here. And uh, if you follow the steps in the readme, you will get a nice LWC recipes um, app within your org. And as you can see from the top, there are then a lot of uh, tabs for the different use cases or mechanisms where that you can leverage in LWC. And if you look a bit more closely here at the end in the more tab, there is also GraphQL hidden and um, showcasing some of the capabilities that um, GraphQL can bring you in the UI. Like all the components that you see are built without like a single line of Apex, but still bringing some data to the UI. Like, leveraging or uh, leveraging GraphQL to build a search where you can actually query some, some records. Um, you have refresh mechanisms built in. And also, as I highlighted before, there are also pagination mechanisms that you can use if you have larger amounts of data um, to uh, split them in a meaningful way so, so that the user can, can easier use them. And um, how this looks like um, on from a code point of view, uh, we can also check out, so I cloned the repository, the LWC um, recipes repository. Um, and if we look at the different example components that are provided there, then in the LWC section, we will find some GraphQL examples, which are precisely the components that we just looked uh, at in the playground. And if we, for example, look at this one, so there's also an example with leveraging the uh, different types of objects in a single query, then the code for that is quite simple, actually. Again, we have the a bit larger or a bit more complex looking structure of our GraphQL query itself. But also here, we always have the exact same import um, for, for leveraging GraphQL or the UI GraphQL uh, wire adapter. And um, then we provide the exact same query code as we also used it in Postman for the platform API level earlier. And in this case, uh, executing two separate queries, in this case, unrelated. So it's not the account at its related context, but it's rather two independent queries that we execute here to get the yeah, first, uh, first five um, records for each of those uh, two objects. And what you can do then is as with all other normal wire adapters, it will inject the result of that query against your org into a property. Of course, you can also handle it in a callback or so if you still want to modify the data, but it will save them in the property here. And then um, there is, if you can, if you look closer at these getters here, you see that you still have this sort of structure with the edges and the nodes and so on that we talked about. So you really also from the wire adapter get this GraphQL schema response that we looked at uh, earlier, which is here in some getters um, predefined or pre-structured in a more like processable way, let's say, to be able to um, show them nicely in the HTML template so that in the HTML template, there are in the end like two of these sections where we have simple iterations iterating over the arrays that were created for the for the getters, once for accounts and once for the contacts, displaying the respective information. And as I as we also checked out the um, the search earlier, so there are also options to modify GraphQL schemas on the fly, and this is using variables. So um, this is the search 
uh, component, even though it's called variables because it like highlights the usage of variables. Um, this reflects the search actually. And as you can see, we have a property specifying the search key, like with the input the user types in, which is something that if we look at the related HTML is just like getting the search value into an input field and like processing or storing that, that value if the user types or the user presses enter into our component. And then um, in our schema, in our GraphQL schema, we are using this search key as a dynamic variable to pass this to our wire adapter. And while we are typing or changing the value in our search, we the wire adapter will dynamically always update and search the uh, latest values based on our search term using or leveraging the lightning data service in the background, which is quite cool and, uh, and powerful from my point of view. And of course, I won't go through all the details um, in terms of the time we have for the session uh, for all of these example components, but I can uh, can definitely recommend to check these out. There are also a lot of other great repositories that contain some, some uh, GraphQL uh, sample components provided from the community. And I would say with that, we more or less get to the end of what we wanted to share with you guys. So I would stop my screen share and hand it back to you, Christopher. Yeah, and that's maybe the perfect moment to jump over the Q and A session. I try all, or I tried it at least in the chat to cover as good as possible. Um, I guess about standard with the mutations, um, we had a little bit of kind of an um, uh, a kind of a hiccup. So in in general, it's now in beta, uh, mm -hmm. but totally right that um, for the wire adapter you showed um, it's not available yet. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that um, to, to just clean up the confusion we had in, in, in forehand. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant before in terms of like where Salesforce is adding more and more functionalities um, to the GraphQL itself uh, on their platform because mutations is a rather new thing um, as beta already indicates in terms of um, the, the capabilities. And obviously that's um, a very important aspect in terms of like, um, yeah, to leverage because it's like, from a, just from a business perspective, most likely you also aim for modification of data rather than just like querying data, at least in some circumstances. Um, yeah, so um, if you have further questions, um, just put them into the chat and maybe, uh, Sebastiano, one tricky one, I guess all objects can be retrieved using GraphQLR. There, there was no limitation we encountered. Uh, for, let's say, all common use cases, not, but there are some restrictions when it comes to tasks or nodes. So there are certain objects that have limited support still, as far as I could, could, could read from the documentation, but I did not like check everything in detail. So um, for, let's say, the main or the crucial objects that where I think we have the most common use cases in general, those were all supported, yeah. Yeah, then we had a great question in terms of like the performance itself, in terms of like, um, as we are just querying one, one endpoint at the time, um, how is the impact on the performance? Um, I must admit, I only played around with it in on the UI level with the with the wire adapter, and there were, depending on how efficient you write your code, there were no too not not too many like improvements compared to the normal REST APIs. The only effort that you save is if you are, let's say, querying multiple objects, multiple entities in the same request, is you save the, the mapping and restructuring of your data in the UI code in the end. But um, in terms of like the loading performance, it was quite similar. Because what you also need to keep in mind, no matter if you use it in the UI layer or in uh, on the Salesforce platform API itself, um, what happens in the background, and this is also maybe sort of obvious if you look at the fact that the same limitations apply as to Sockle. I can well imagine that in the background, Salesforce still leverages Sockle or somehow transforms this so that the GraphQL runtime in the end transforms your GraphQL request into actually performing the respective Sockle queries. That's at least how I imagine this to work without knowing all, all the technical insights there, of course. Yeah, so from a performance perspective, 
I had once a chat um, with with somebody um, at the developer group in, in Berlin, and they showed a great example in terms of like how they leverage GraphQL um, for, for their use case. Um, so they, they build up some kind of also like um, components to retrieve data as um, replacement for um, for the related list. So I don't go and bother you with now all the kind of technical details and, and the, the root courses. But it turns out, based on their experience, it was super fast. So um, just from a purely performance um, point of view, they were super satisfied how fast they could retrieve the data um, and like the, the page load was improving that. So, so there was definitely some, some kind of upsides here. Um, let me check. Um, there was a great question. Um, obviously, now Sebastian read, you already stroked out um, the two different pills. Um, so would you now prefer to use GraphQL over REST uh, all the time? Or um, that that's now the tricky question, right, at the end. So yeah. it's your, your recommendation here. Yeah, I think, I mean, I could give the typical consultant answer, right? It depends. <laughs> it depends actually on your use case, right? So similarly, as you also need to like differ between different kind of REST APIs with the composite API bulk, uh, the normal REST, the REST endpoints uh, when it comes to like different use cases, if you do large data, uh, large data migrations, or if you like simply leverage few like accounts because you want to like show them in a UI component or so. Um, I think it depends on the use case, really. Um, I think GraphQL is quite handy because it gives me really only what precisely what I'm interested in. And I found that the way how I can structure the query dynamically and even perform different type of data modifications or queries in one single call is pretty convenient. And I think I saw it at a glance in the chat as well. Someone was also mentioning composite API because you can also query multiple objects. Um, yeah. I uh, checked this as well. And at least as far as I know, there are a few like lower limits when it comes to composite API, right? I think you can only do, what was it? 25 concurrent API calls in one composite request or something like that. Um, I don't know the the exact limit by heart there, but um, I think there were some 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 more limitations, but um, definitely worth checking in detail. And again, if you leverage the composite API, you just have a like bunch of REST API calls that you execute, right? Whereas with GraphQL, GraphQL you really have a combined schema, um, which I at least personally think is preferable. But I think this is also a bit developer preference in the end or architect's preference. Yeah, maybe from just adding one architect note here is like um as Sebastian, you already stroked out in terms of like what what you should leverage here is like the the general recommendations are like really thinking about your use case you want to solve and what is like the the purpose of the integration and there are great documentations around there taking well architected as a kind of a real good starting point and they're providing a huge list and overview in terms of like what are kind of different use cases? Um, what is like the, the the perfect tool to or which fits and and solve like your, your use case? And then obviously you can think about yourself in terms of like um, going over the list, thinking and, and maybe it's just like um, a kind of a slight uh, sticky note which helps you like don't forget like okay what kind of toolkits I have available. To really figure out is like what is like the preferred solution approach for your particular business use case so obviously there's not like the, the one fits all solution and hopefully we stroke that out in the beginning so um understand graphql as a kind of and then one additional toolkit um or part of your toolkit now um as sebastiano stroke out it, it can be really convenient and help in, in some circumstances but obviously there are also certain limitations and um, potential obstacles you need to overcome. So for some smaller ones, I also answered in the chat already. And um, maybe, maybe um, yeah, you, you answer that maybe um, on the voice line as well as like, um, does GraphQL respect the security settings? So the answer is yes, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was like an, kind of an easy one. 
Uh, does it does it internally use fetch API? I guess per hour, right? So mm, no, it's XHR. I also misread it the, uh, uh, at the first uh, place. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I must admit, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure how this is solved um, in Salesforce internally, um, but would be definitely interested into that answer as well. Cool. Um, maybe final chance for one or two more. And I guess then we are running out of time. Obviously, we are happy to answer them afterwards. Um, any follow up question? Maybe so, you already like um, the huge link list. Yes. We use it from this. Uh, you mean like like there's a question in chat that asks um, whether the um, if I leverage it from LWC within the platform whether this counts to the API request limits for the org overall. Um, I would say no. Similarly to the other um, REST based UI wire adapters, um, this is not count counting towards it. Uh, yeah, next question also popping up, also interesting one, um, whether we can run the, the GraphQL without sharing, <laughs> like you could, uh, could do it in Apex. Um, I think no, as far as I know. So, um, in the, uh, with the LWC wire adapter anyway, no, but, uh, in, in Apex, I mean, theoretically, you can also leverage the, the, the GraphQL, um, uh, GraphQL platform API there as well. Um, but I'm not sure how it would behave actually, because I didn't try that. If you uh, would run your Apex class without sharing and perform a request from there as well. Um, not sure if this actually works, but would be maybe worth looking into, but I would anyway, not recommend it to be honest. Yeah, that's like a strong recommendation to, to not do it. There, there's a good reason why it's designed in, in that regards and, um, bypassing, um, running everything without sharing is like you open like kind of Pandora's box with that. And and I, I never would recommend to, to go for such a solution approach. I can only second this. Okay, then uh, if there's no direct question popping up in chat, then I can also uh, paste the link uh, list, let's say of some, uh, some resources that we yeah partly talked about in the session um, that we par uh, partly also used um, to 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 collect all the topics um, for this session for you. Um, and I'm not sure maybe we can also as part of the recording of the session uh, this can be put into the video description. I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, there are also some things like uh, trailheads where that help you getting started with uh, the Salesforce Postman collection if you want to look into that and um, yeah. So hopefully this will help you to to get started with GraphQL overall. <laughs>